Some background, I have severe chronic depression with psychosis and a severe anxiety disorder. I also have a seizure disorder which is exasperated by anxiety. My stalker wasn't always a stalker. At first he was my best friend's oldest brother, and by default he always seemed to be my older brother as well. Our families were very close. Eventually my family moved away, as the Navy brats, we were, and I lost contact with my best friend. A few years later, we found each other on Facebook and of course I added all of her siblings as friends. I would talk to her twin brother a lot, as we had similar interests. Her oldest brother, however, was on a mission for the LDS church. After he returned, his parents mentioned to my family that he was having a hard time adjusting and to please message him so he would feel more welcome, like people remembered him in his absence. Of course, I, being a fairly caring individual, messaged him. It started with small talk. How are you? What have you been up to lately, ECT? His name was Scott, and he was six years older than my best friend and I. And he had some mental health issues of his own. At the time, my psychosis was uncontrolled and I had a delusion that I had a guardian angel following me to protect me from the demon shadow beings that wanted to corrupt me and steal my soul. His name was Athen, probably a name I got from a book or something. Scott encouraged this delusion and said that Athen would visit him and talk to him and he would tell me about their conversations about me. Eventually, Scott seemed to become jealous of my close relationship with Athen and told me that Athen had told him that he was leaving me because someone else needed him and that he was appointing Scott to be my new guardian. I of course was devastated. I told Scott I didn't want him to be my guardian, I wanted Athen. He got upset and asked me why I hated him, why didn't I love him anymore? This was a common occurrence, these outbursts claiming I hated him, trying to guilt me into agreeing to things. This wasn't the only stunt he pulled either. He would get angry if I didn't message him back within a minute or so and resend messages over and over and then send rants about what a terrible person I was and how he hoped I would be raped or murdered. Then he would send rants about how sorry he was and ask me to forgive him. He would say he would hurt himself if I didn't forgive him and even sent me a picture of a gash on his arm. When I couldn't text on my way to school because of rain, he would send me screenshots of the forecast in my area and say I was lying to him and asking why I hated him. During school when I couldn't text, he would send message after message. During final exams, he sent several hundred messages, sometimes 15 pages long. He would send screenshots of earlier conversations and claim I had lied to him about something. If I told him I would be ignoring my phone for a couple hours to hang out with my boyfriend, he would call me a worthless slut, which hurt because I have been raped in the past and that's what the rapist called me. I believed it was my fault for far too long. I think that's when I created Athen to protect me. But with my boyfriend, we hadn't even kissed yet because I was afraid of what it could lead to and I wasn't ready to be intimate or touched at all really. Understandably, I was traumatized. If I said I was busy in church activities, I was trying to be a good Christian girl at this point, I am in no way Christian now. He would complain that I wasn't talking to him, that I must hate him, ECT. Then it got weird. He told me that he had a dream where he and I were married and had a kid. I told him politely that I was in no way interested in him like that and emphasized the fact that he had always been like a brother to me. He went on to tell me that it was of course just a dream and you can't control your dreams and of course he didn't really feel that way. But he still acted creepy. He would say he loved me and I would say something like love you too like a brother but I was getting scared. The stress took a toll on me. I got very sick and then had a severe allergic reaction to the medication called Stevens Johnson syndrome. I had a high fever and my face was swollen and my body was blistering. I could hardly eat, both because of the swelling and blisters in my mouth and because of the fatigue. The only thing I ate in three days was an apple cut into pieces so small I had to use a toothpick to get them in my mouth and basically swallowed the bits whole. My point here is, I was in no shape to be texting all the time. If I sank into a deep depression and wanted just to be alone, not texting or talking, or even eating, I would tell him, 
I do this, I want to talk right now. But he insisted. He would send dozens of messages and get mad at me when I said I was listening to a movie while I dozed because I should have been talking to him if I was well enough to listen to a movie. Yeah, great logic. After I recovered, I was no longer afraid to upset him and told him I would not text as much. But he still sent tons of messages, which I deleted without reading. I told him over and over to stop messaging and ranting at me that the stress was making me ill and I had a life other than texting him. He practically exploded. I was at a presentation my boyfriend was giving and Scott wouldn't stop texting me. Finally, I got fed up with telling him to leave me alone and told him to never message me again to fall in a hole for all I cared. All was silent for a few days, then I got a message on Facebook. It was a picture of minor road rash and an accusation that somehow I made him fall in a hole while on his bicycle. I told him to leave me alone. He wavered between telling me he loved me and ranting at me for hating him, quoting violent and somewhat rapey music lyrics at me. This isn't the creepiest thing he did either. He created a fake Facebook account of a girlfriend where the profile picture was of the girl who played Gretchen in Mean Girls. She would talk to me about how I was breaking poor Scotty's heart and other crap. It was obvious it was a fake account, and she would tell me about being visited by Athen, and Athen would tell her to tell me to be nicer to Scott. And probably creepier, he somehow found out what apartment complex my sister lived in in an entirely different state and sent her a picture if it. He started messaging my family, telling them I was mean to him and he wished I would die, ECT. I had a strange schedule at school. I would walk to school to catch a bus to a different school for half of the day and then catch a bus back for the other half. I promise this is relevant. I was terrified at this point. He was obsessive and honestly scared me. Well, one day on the bus ride back to the school, I could have sworn I saw him walking down the street toward my school. I panicked. I stared hyperventilating and ducked my head down so he couldn't see me. I was convinced he was following me and was going to hurt me. After all, he said he wished I was dead. I was completely sure that he was going to do something. Now remember, my psychosis was uncontrolled. I was extremely paranoid and panicked easily. The man, of course, turned out not to be Scott. After this, I realized what a toxic environment my involvement with home created. I told him goodbye and blocked him on social media, my phone, and even changed my email. He used a texting app to text me and rent the same old things that he loved me. Why did I hate him? Why didn't I love him anymore? ECT. I blocked him over and over again. Eventually, things went quiet. A new number and new rent every few days, then weekly, and then a month or two would pass. I blocked him every time. After a couple of years, I thought he was gone for good. I was exited. I was graduating early, and I felt accomplished. I sent a graduation announcement to my best friend, hoping she would send her own back. Instead, I received a card from her address. It said it was from her, but when I opened it, it was from Scott. He was congratulating me on my graduation and asking me to please email him because he was so sorry. I shredded the card and never told anyone. But I was terrified all over again. He had my address. All I could think about for months was that he might physically stalk me. I spent a lot of time looking out on my shoulder, scanning rooms and streets, making sure he wasn't near. I had nightmares where he would find me and quote those strange, violent lyrics at me before strangling me to death. Of course, this never happened. He stayed away. Because of his fixation, my best friend's father denied a job position in my state, in my county even. I would have been so close to my best friend again, but of course, that means I would be close to my stalker too. My best friend and I have never forgiven him for that. Because of him, best friends were kept far apart. She has visited me a couple of times, and last I heard, Scott married a schizophrenic girl and they're living off of government aid. So, to wrap this up, I'd like to thank whoever actually read this to the end, I think it was therapeutic for me to write it out. For anyone that cares, my psychosis 
and anxiety disorder are well under control. We're still working on the depression thing, but it's getting better slowly. Finally, I would like to say, I hate you, Scott. You stole any smidge of a sense of security I had. You used my psychosis against me, and you kept me from my best friend. This is my first time posting, and this is by far the weirdest thing to have happened to me. This all took place around two years ago. I was 17 at the time living in Northern England. For some background, my mother is a single mother because my dad left before I was born. She works very hard, and in the whole 17 years leading up to this point, it was always just me and her. She had never had a boyfriend or anything like that, but just before my 17th birthday, this is what happened. It wasn't long before Christmas, and my mother had told me that she was speaking to one of her old friends from school on Facebook and was going to ask him to come round for some food and a drink as a catch-up. At this point, I had no male role model in my life whatsoever, so I can't say I wasn't a little excited myself that my mother had finally met someone after so long. On the day he came round, I was out most of the night because my mother had bought me two tickets to see 50 Cent for me and a friend as an early Christmas present, so we went and my friend stayed over after. This is when I first made contact with the man I'll call Dan, so he stands up, shakes my hand, and tells me he's heard a lot about me and all seems good. He even bought us food and convinced my mom to give me another early Christmas present, so I liked him already. If only I knew then what I know now. So now you're all caught up in what happened around November, fast forward to January, which is when my birthday is, and I was turning 17. Now this had already started to feel a bit weird to me because Dan had already moved into my house, but I just thought he might have been struggling, even though he always went on about that he worked offshore on the oil rigs, he had three houses that are all up for rent, so you would expect him to have a fair bit of cash, but he never seemed to have any. So anyway, my 17th birthday comes, and I asked my mom if I can have a party just messing with her because it was obvious she'd say no, and she did, but then Dan overhears and convinces her to let me, and they will both stay so it doesn't get out of hand. So I invited my friends over, and we're having a good time, and I'm really starting to like Dan even though I had only known him a short amount of time. He seemed to understand what it's like to be my age. So the party's going well, everyone's enjoying it, then Dan sits in the front room with us. This is where it started to get a little off. I am the funny one in my friendship group, so I made my friends laugh quite a lot, but Dan didn't really seem to like it. I don't really know what he was thinking, but he started talking to all of my friends as if he were competing with me and belittling me at every chance he got. I thought it was a little weird, but I'd never had a father figure before, so I thought he was just joking. But as the night went on, it got weirder. He came up to me later on and pulled out a tiny bag with cocaine inside and offered me some. Being 17, if your mom's boyfriend offers you coke in front of your friends, that has to be the coolest thing in the world, so I accepted his offer. He then said to me, don't tell your mom or I'll get into trouble, and I agreed I wouldn't. Believe me, I'd be in a lot more trouble than he would if I did tell her. So anyway, Dan got more and more drunk, then started to like my friends more than I did. He then made a comment to one of my friend's girlfriends, who was 16 and he was late 30s, asking if she wanted to go upstairs, which she replied no, and came up to me asking what the hell is his problem. I shook it off again saying that he was just messing around. So the parties are over and it's a few days later and Dan is acting really weird. Not to my face, but behind my back. For example, my mom would ask me to wash the dishes or to clean my room, and Dan would say, don't worry about it, just leave them, you go out, and I'll do it. So, I said thanks, went out, and when I'd come home, the dishes wouldn't be done, and my room would be a mess, so I'd get into crap for it. It was just stupid things like this that began to make me start thinking. This is where the worst part comes in. My mom and Dan are going out drinking for the night, which is strange since my mom never normally drinks, but I assumed she's just going because he wanted to. So, I invited my girlfriend over to stay the night while they were gone and we ordered food, watched movies, then fell asleep. We were then awoken by my mom screaming, and oh Dan, please don't, and Dan screaming at her saying, I'll end you and your freaking son. 
So, I told my girlfriend to wait in bed and gave her a small metal pole from my weight set to defend herself in case anything happened, then I proceeded downstairs. When I got downstairs it was crazy. There was a hole straight through my TV. The glass cabinet had been smashed and Dan had my mother by her arm, screaming in her face that she's no good and loads of other horrible things. I shout, get the hell off her. They both freeze, calm down, and straight away he says, I didn't hit her. Do you really think I'd do that? In the calmest voice ever. So I did what any mature teenager would do and punched that cunt straight in the nose, but obviously he has muscles bigger than my waist, so he just tackles me to the floor and punches me. All of a sudden someone bangs on the door, but they didn't stop to wait to see if anyone answered. It was just repeated until Dan answered the door. My next door neighbor was there with a firearm in his hand and he said, have you been freaking hitting her? And Dan is extremely calm again and says, what are you talking about? I then stand in the doorway behind him bleeding from my nose and nod. My next door neighbor then dragged him outside and they both started fighting in my front garden. Dan had been hit by the firearm, so he was bleeding from his head and had blood down his face. The police then arrived. My neighbor obviously called them before he started swinging the firearm around, which was a smart move. Dan was swiftly arrested and my neighbor also got taken to court. But the craziest thing is that my mom stuck up for Dan. She was obviously just scared, so I made a statement to the police because God only knows what he would have done if my neighbor didn't come. Dan is thankfully now in jail. But the weirdest part about it all is that me and my mom talked about it a few months later and she said he never had any money, he didn't have three houses, he lived with his mother and had lied about it all. He was just living off of me full time and he had spent a lot of my money. So for a while we thought we would have to sell the house. My mom is a fighter though, so she worked her butt off to pay all the debts owed and kept the house, but she also said, he told me you took cocaine and always refused to do things he asked. I denied at the time, but she knows the truth now as I'm older, I can't help but think that he was trying to get in between me and my mom to bring us down, when in fact it only made us closer. She's fine now and we still live in the same house. I asked her about why he hit her and she said, Dan claimed I slept with one of your friends at your party, which was quite funny because my mom wasn't even there, but that just shows how crazy he was. Dan, let's never ever ever meet again. I go to university in Washington. One night I woke up around 3 a.m. to yelling. Not bickering between two people or an angry man on the phone, it was one man yelling loud enough that it sounded as though he was yelling at someone who was a block away. He was yelling things along the lines of, I hate you, you mother freaking cunt, and I'm going to kill you, you mother freaking cunt, so obviously I was terrified. I lived on the ground floor and my bed was next to a big window. I was too terrified to look out of the window to see what this man looked like or how far away he was. The yelling continued for around 10 minutes while I laid completely still. In the morning, I left my house to drive to class. When I got to my car, I noticed the door was ajar. I hadn't connected the two situations yet. I was just concerned about my registration or insurance card, the only valuable things ever in my car. When I opened the door to assess the damage, I noticed something on the middle console. It was a pocket knife. I picked it up without gloves. Etched on the handle of the blade was cut a bitch. And on the blade was etched cut as if he had started to write the same page, but ran out of time. The thought that the yelling man did this now crosses my mind, and the fact that nothing was stolen but a knife was left gave me chills. I immediately went back inside and brought the knife to my housemate in tears. We called the police to report the car break-in and give them our evidence. They documented it as a car break-in and potential threat because of the yelling I heard the night before. I slept at my friend's house that night and the next day wondered if we had overreacted by calling the police. We just planned to sleep at home that night. At 12.30 a.m., while getting ready for bed, someone rang our doorbell three times. We saw someone walking away from our house out the side window immediately after. This could have been a harmless person with the wrong address, 
but regardless, my housemate and I were still on edge and went to sleep at different houses. I dropped her off at her boyfriend's house, which was about two blocks away, and drove to the same friend's house I had slept at the night before. This friend lives maybe five blocks away from me, in the same neighborhood by the university. I went inside and was getting ready for bed. I was planning to sleep on the couch in the living room, right in front of the front window and door. It was 1.30 a.m., and I had been there ten minutes and was on the couch when I heard the knocking. Knocking is putting it lightly, this was banging. I could see a figure through the blind, so I sunk down further into the couch so they couldn't see me. The banging continued and I ran upstairs to my friend. We sat in her bed with the door closed and a bat in hand. Nobody else who lived in her house was there that night, so it was just us. We called Crime Check so they could send a patrol car and hopefully get there before the guy left. He stopped knocking for a couple of minutes and then came back and continued for maybe five more. When the cops finally arrived, we had to call Crime Check again to make sure it was actually the cops who were banging on the door and not a stranger. Even better, when talking to the police, they seemed annoyed that we didn't answer the door sooner and had the audacity to ask us if we asked the guy what he wanted. They said it was probably just someone drunk or on drugs. In our opinion, it was too much of a coincidence with the past two days we had just been through. I can't help but think that the yelling man had watched us leave our house that night and followed me to my friend's home. Especially because the first night I slept at her house I didn't drive myself, so my car wasn't parked in front. It's been a year now since then and nothing else has happened, but every time I think about it I'm creeped out. Yelling man, let's definitely not meet. When I was in third grade there was this girl in my class. She wasn't particularly liked by anyone as she was quite the bully and overall a rude person, even to adults. She was known to have anger issues and get mad at people for what seemed like no reason. I was no exception. Her name was Carly. She had been mean to me in the past, but that didn't deter me from going to her house one day after she had been nice to me all day at school. Naive, I know. So before leaving school that day I called my mom to ask if I was allowed to go to Carly's house. She said yes and to call her when I get there so I can give her the address. Now when I think back I wonder if she had a bad feeling about the situation since she doesn't normally ask for the address and she isn't picking me up since Carly's house was about two blocks away. When I got there, after calling my mom of course, Carly insisted on making me look pretty aka wetting my hair and brushing it. I let her. Then she told me to close my eyes and that she was taking me to the living room. I closed my eyes and she began to guide me towards the bathtub. We were already in the bathroom, so the tub was a solid two feet away from where we were standing. I opened my eyes just enough to see where she was guiding me. My foot hit the side of the tub and I said that this didn't feel like the living room. She said it was and that I just needed to step over the gate. I tell her that I know this is the bathtub. She stops trying to get me into the tub and brings me to the kitchen instead. She says she is going to make cereal. I was standing behind her when she reached into her dishwasher and said she was grabbing a spoon. The way that she clarified that she was grabbing a spoon immediately told me what she was really going to grab. And it was for sure not a spoon. I can still remember the feeling of dread that overcame me when she said those words. She pulls out a large knife and backs me up into a counter, holding the knife only inches away from my neck. I can't remember if any words were exchanged during this, maybe I was just too shocked to say anything. I only stayed there for maybe 30 seconds before I pushed her aside and ran towards the door. I grabbed my backpack and put on my winter boots. By the time I had my boots on Carly was trying to block the sliding door. I pushed past her again and flung open the door. I ran down her patio steps and out her front gate. Not bothering to close it. I just wanted to get home to where I was safe. I remember her yelling at me as her dogs escaped through the open gate. I didn't care. One of her neighbors who was in their front lawn waved and smiled at me, clearly oblivious to what had just gone down. I ran down the road and to my house. Not stopping once. It wasn't until I was in the door of my house that I broke down. 
I began to cry and yell for my mom. My two older sisters yelled at me to shut up. My mom walked over to me and immediately knew something was wrong. I explained what happened and she was very understanding and freaked out. I can't remember if it was the same day or the next day that I had to talk to a police officer about what happened. He asked me what kind of knife it was and whatnot. I think my mom relayed most of the story to him because I don't remember having to say much. They got in contact with Carly's foster mom and Carly got in big crap for it. At school Carly yelled at me for getting the cops involved and tried to guilt trip me by saying that her mom threatened to put her back in foster care if she did anything like that again. I told her I didn't care. The school was also notified of the situation and the teachers made sure to keep an extra eye on her, but that didn't mean I wasn't paranoid around her, I made sure to keep my guard up for the rest of the school year. Which was true, she had it coming. I always thought that it was a bit extreme to involve the cops, but I ended up making Carly never mess with me again. I ended up moving after that year for unrelated reasons, only to move back before I started sixth grade. The first day of middle school, I was waiting for them to call my name so I knew which class was my homeroom when I heard an all too familiar name. Carly, I watch as no one goes up to join the class. Was she not here? Next, I was called. I go up to join the class that she would have been in. I found out later when the teacher was doing attendance that she had moved three hours away just before the beginning of the school year. It's been three years since then and I can only hope she doesn't come back, but if she does I'm not too concerned. And if she does, I will make sure that she stays the hell away from me. That incident has given me some trust issues, but at least now I know to choose my friends wisely. This happened to me two years ago. It was my first month on the job and I worked night security at this pretty interesting place. For the record, I still work there and have more strange stories possibly to tell in the future. I am a 38-year-old male. I've worked security jobs most of my life and the graveyard shift. I was an event security guard for various well-known concert venues for years. So, I've seen my fair share of strange things and crazy people. In other words, I don't scare easily and hardly ever go into a panic mode when a crisis comes up. The place I currently work is a resort-style apartment complex. To get the layout, there are three floors of apartments with 50 units on each floor. This place takes up one city block with a golf course in the back, indoor swimming pools, hot tubs, and a small movie theater. You name it, this place has it. Most of the residents are retired doctors, lawyers, and otherwise rich. There are some younger people that live here as well, stockbrokers and real estate agents and so on. Some just use their apartment in the summer and leave as soon as the snow falls. It is located in a well-known tourist town in the United States. The building itself has 12 exits on the first floor. The doors are locked at 11 p.m., you can exit, but you can't get back in unless you go to the front of the building and ask to be buzzed in or pick up the call box phone next to whatever exit you are at. It will ring the company's cell phone and I answer and can come let you in. The front lobby is set up much like a hotel, with sliding glass doors which I lock when I start my shift. In the middle of the building on the first floor are two big slider doors which I also lock. They lead to the private parking lot. The parking lot itself is gated and you need a code to get in. This was midsummer, and while it's never really hot here, tonight was an exception, it was still very warm after the sun had set. I came in 10 minutes to 11 to start my shift. We have a routine to hand off the keys, event log and phone to the next person on duty. Despite its size, I am the only security person here at night. My coworker who was leaving told me the side iron gates that lead to the parking lot are open on one side because they are stuck. This is nothing new and they often do get jammed. She told me the repair people would be in tomorrow sometime to fix them but to just do some extra patrol out there tonight. This place sits across the road from a public park and while the area is pretty decent, the park tends to breed druggies and homeless at night who sometimes like to try and wander on the property or cause trouble. My night started out as uneventful. As a security guard in this place, we only have pepper spray, a large flashlight, keys, and a company cell phone to call 911 if need be. 
We are told not to confront bodily harm, nor can we detain anyone. We are simply eyes and ears, and to call the police if something comes up. Of course you can defend yourself if you need to, but in all cases if you are in danger, calling the police is the company policy. Basically, I am to walk the grounds and floors for anyone suspicious, watch the cameras in the security office which is in the lobby, and otherwise try to stay alert. If a resident calls for a maintenance request, I would take the information down in the computer for day shift, or if a resident called with a security issue, I would attend to it. Pretty easy enough job, I thought. I locked the doors to the parking lot and the lobby doors. I did a sweep of all the floors and then found myself back at the desk. It was really quiet and it rolled around to 3 a.m. I had just sat down to eat my lunch when the company's cell phone rang. The caller ID let me know it was from one of our outside call box phones. I picked it up and said, thanks for calling. Resort name here. This is Security Officer James. How can I help you? All I heard was someone breathing heavy. I glanced at the cameras and could see the shadow of a figure standing just out of reach from the door and camera view. All I could see is the open call box and the metal cord from the phone. I again asked how I can help. The man started to breathe heavier and laugh then silence. It was one of those laughs you hear in a movie when the lunatic is about to do something terrible. I got up from my chair and started to walk out of the office and to the door he was at when it rang again. This time from call box number two which was further down. I quickly looked at the camera and saw this large figure in a hooded jacket. I knew this was strange as it was very warm outside. He was holding a black bag in his hands, but had his back to the camera. I'm coming for you and you're gonna die, this voice said in a raspy deep tone. He hung up before I had the chance to say anything. Then the phone rang again. This time I picked up and before he could speak I let him know the cops are on their way and to leave the property now as he is on camera. He tried the doors and both were locked. This time he was at yet another call box. This guy had to be running at top speed to make it to the next and the next call box as they are a good distance between doors on the outside. I can see you. Are you ready to die? The cops won't make it here in time, the guy said. I spoke loud and pretended like I was talking to another security officer and asked him to send three other security guards to such and such a location and that police were dispatched. The guy slammed the phone down loud against the call box receiver and I watched him on camera take off into the darkness to the park area. I figured it scared him off. I was going to call the police, but honestly the location of this place it would take them at least 15 minutes to get here and I figured this guy was just some tweaker from the park. I scanned the cameras and walked the backlit just to be sure no one was there. I had my pepper spray in my hands just in case, but no one was out there. I returned to my desk and wrote what happened in the incident log. About a half hour passed and I had finished lunch and was just about to do rounds when the phone rang again. This time it was from an unknown number. I thought it would be a resident calling for a repair issue or something. I picked up and said my normal line. Where are the cops? I don't see them, but I see you, the voice said. Crap. It was that guy again. I scanned the cameras and did not see anything. I went to the front door to look out and there was nothing but darkness and a few front flood lights on. I know you're alone and you are going to die soon, he said. I basically told him to get crapped and hung up. I called the non-emergency number to 911 and let them know what was going on. The dispatcher said she would send out a car to check the area and make contact with me. Next thing I hear is a loud thud against the glass windows to the day manager's office, which sits across from the security room. Another three loud bangs. I run to the door and unlock it. I pull up the shades and shine my flashlight through the window into the darkness. I catch the face of this hooded man. He looked to be about 40 with long stringy hair poking down and these wild eyes. He looked right at me and grinned before slamming his head into the window to try and break it. I started yelling at him and told him the cops are coming and to get the hell out of here. That's when he pulled the biggest damn butcher knife I've ever seen and made a slicing motion like he would use it to cut my throat. This guy was crazy and probably on drugs. He continued slamming his body against the glass trying to break it. 
He used his head to try and break the window, but managed to bust his head open, so the window now has blood all over it. I backed out of the office and locked the door to it. I then decided to wait for the cops as this guy was out of control and my pepper spray wasn't going to stop him and the last thing I wanted was to handle a bloody crazy person. He then ran to the nearest side door and took the call box phone off the hook. He then ran to each call box and removed all the phones which caused my company's cell phone to ring and jam up the line. This guy had to be on meth or something because he ran as fast as I could imagine. I watched the camera and noticed to my horror the sliding door to the garage was open. Now it was common for residents to go out to their cars and unlock the door themselves. It's just a sliding lock like the kind in department stores, but this is the last thing I need with this nut job running around. I sprinted across the building and took a shortcut through a couple banquet rooms to make it to the garage. As I was doing so, I saw the crazy guy running up the garage pathway. I slid that door as fast as I could and locked it before he got to the entryway. He then slammed his body into the glass. Over and over, but the door did not move. I locked the second set of doors in case he got through the outside once he would at least be trapped or slow him down. I reached for my pepper spray, thinking maybe he would just leave and yelled the cops are here. He started to laugh and howl and then held that knife up again before running into the darkness of the parking garages. I called the cops on my personal cell phone to let them know that the man has a knife. The dispatcher told me the cops will be there shortly and I let her know what happened. I made my way to the front again and locked myself in the security office. At least this place had no windows and I could watch on camera. I heard another loud thud and bang and realized he was at the front lobby doors trying to get in. I was hoping the cops would roll up any minute, but they didn't and while it probably didn't take them long it felt like forever at this point. The guy was standing at the lobby doors with the knife in hand, he faced the camera and by this time his hood had fallen back. He was bald-headed with wild, long, stringy, crazy hair on the sides of his head. His eyes were huge and I will never forget that grin on his face as he mouthed to the camera die die while making stabbing motions with that knife. Blood running across his face from slamming into the glass, he then ran out into the darkness. About five minutes later the cops show up. They sent one officer. He asked me what the guy looked like and I told him I have camera footage. He drove through the area first and shined a spotlight. The cop returned to tell me he couldn't find anyone and he had driven around the entire block and back area behind the golf course. I showed him the footage and printed out a picture from the camera. The cop said he didn't see any sign of the guy and that he would patrol the area and to call back if he came again. It was now nearly 5 a.m. when the cop left. I waited until 6 a.m. when it was daylight and people were starting to get out and about before I walked around and hung up all the phones from the call boxes. This guy literally took all 12 phones off the hook. When my manager came in during the morning shift at 8 a.m., I told her what happened and she said that they would keep an eye out and have a meeting to let everyone who worked here know and to be aware. They had an extra security guard on my shift for two weeks after but the guy never returned. The cops never found the guy or who he was. So crazy bloody guy with the knife, let's not meet again. This is a story that pops back up in my mind from time to time. I've only told it to a few people, but I definitely feel like it deserves its place here. It's for sure one of the scariest moments I've ever had as a child. Back when I was around 10 years old, my mom finally decided that it was time for her to start taking her driver's license. When she began taking lessons, she was struggling a lot. For that reason, my dad decided that he wanted to do some practice with her besides the official driving lessons with her instructor, just to make sure that she'd pass the upcoming test first try. My little brother and I were attending swimming lessons at this nearby university at the time. Behind a forested area near the university lies this huge student parking area surrounded by trees, which turned out to be basically empty every weekend. My dad saw the opportunity to take my mom here to drive around for a bit and brought my little brother and I with them since we were too young to stay home alone. We bought a football with us. When we arrived at the parking lot later on in the evening, my parents began their practice. 
My little brother and I quickly got bored though and asked if we could go over to this little grass field on the side of the parking lot to play some football. My parents let us since they'd always be able to keep their eyes on us whilst driving around. After playing for some time, my parents ended up driving around in the other end of the parking lot. They were approximately 300 to 400 meters away from my brother and I. Suddenly, this white Toyota pulls into the parking lot. We were playing almost right at the exit slash entrance. The car turns around and stops on my right side with the vehicle facing the exit. The driver rolls down his windows and presents himself as Thomas. He looked friendly, was good looking and young, a guess would be around 30. This is where things started to get weird. On the passenger seat was a woman covering her face with a newspaper. All I could see was long blonde hair. And on the back seat was a baby sitting in a baby chair. Thomas immediately states that he's from the police and that we have to get in the car immediately as he has to talk to us. My brother actually took two steps towards the vehicle, but I stuck my arm in front of his chest as I was sensing something was off. The woman was still covering her face at this point, not saying a word. Thomas then raised his voice and told us once again to get in the car or else he'd have to come out and get us. My brother and I froze out of fear. Suddenly the woman put down the newspaper, showed her face, and told us in the most calm motherly voice to just listen to the man. The woman looked young, pretty, and like a person who wouldn't hurt a fly. At this moment, I began screaming as loud as I could. What we hadn't seen at that point was that my dad was already running as fast as he could towards us. He was coming from behind the vehicle, so we didn't see it. My parents didn't have time to drive to us since the road down the parking lot was twisted all the way. When my dad heard my scream, he started yelling as loud as he could saying, Hey, who the hell are you? get the hell away from my children. As soon as Thomas heard my dad, he realized my brother and I weren't alone. He threw his car into gear and took off as fast as he could. He most definitely looked like a person who shed himself when he saw my dad. My dad was furious and told my brother and I to hurry up back to the car. He didn't even think about calling the police at that point. He wanted to beat up the guy himself. That resulted in us driving around for the next hour trying to find him before my dad cooled down and decided that he should probably just call the police. We never found out who these people were. But this episode taught me to never judge a book by its cover. People can be the most friendly looking people in the world and still wish evil upon you or the ones you love. I'm not sure what these people would have done to us. I am sure about one thing though. They definitely weren't from the police. This happened to me back in 2008 to the early 2010s. When I was 11, I met a girl who was the same age as me since 6th grade. She and I weren't the same classmates until high school, but we were in the same school. By the middle of 6th grade, things got creepy. Somehow she was everywhere every time I had an extra class, including every time I had to switch from another schedule to another schedule. My entire life I never gave my private information to her, but I was half aware she knew by her own eyes even though she was in the vicinity. Unfortunately, I had reported it to the teacher slash faculty members, but they brushed off my warning as a ruse because I didn't have enough evidence to prove it was her. What's worse, we weren't allowed to bright any electronic devices, like phones for example. Four pieces of evidence against her except calculator for maths and physic. This bothered me forever, she even shared the same home economics class and swimming lessons as mine during the 8th grade, but yet again not the same group. Even in 9th grade, she still kept following me non-stop, despite I warned her to leave me alone. After I graduated at 15, I left for a high school to start over, even though I forgot about her until the middle of October 2012. She's back. My skin turned pale as well and my heart beat like I was in panic mode. This girl, how did she even know I'm in high school that I enrolled in and more importantly, I again, didn't leak my information everywhere, not even to her. Once again, she won't leave me alone and she starts to get worse. She guilt tripped me into befriending her to let her use my belongings whether it was permission or not, despite her soft manner it was a red flag, to begin with, that I could have avoided it sooner. 
On another occasion, she overheard me and my classmate conversing about mine wanting a key charm that my classmate had. But on the next day, she attacked me after I took a seat in the class because she knew that I wanted something that she didn't. This incident caught the attention of the principal in my high school, and the principal recapped the whole situation by writing a statement report. I ended up rewrite twice because of error grammar, and by the third the principal made the decision. She was suspended for a week, but it wasn't enough. She returned after a week and accused me of her suspension, which I wasn't involved in with her drama, even though I didn't have another choice but to report my statement for my safety. And once again, she guilt-tripped me for other reasons by hypocritically calling me for being a terrible friend, even so far she destroyed one of my belongings and supplies. I called her out, but she pretended she didn't remember it. Worse, she framed a student for having a torn notebook that she destroyed, and yet she refused to admit her mistakes. That was my last straw as it made my blood boil, but I didn't want to show my anger as she gave me a watch in exchange for money, which turns out, she swindled and got away with it. In all situations, half of my peers and teachers witnessed this incident and warned me that I should end her friendship with her. She wasn't my friend, just saw me as a pawn and manipulated me by taking advantage of my kindness and trust. We were still the same in high school, but I quietly outright refused to be close with her again. That's it until early December of 2012, that was the last time I saw her, and I guessed that she was expelled after the last warning from one of my peers. I felt relieved, but I will never forget what she did to not only me but to the other half of my peers as well. By near the end of high school, I realized that she was indeed not a very good friend and her attitude was sociopathic, manipulative, liar, and almost creepy, and that was the reason why I ended things with her for good. Luckily, I didn't give her phone number or address since that wasn't allowed in the school which I managed to avoid the red flag. It's been almost 16 years since this incident took place after I finished my high school in 2015, I'm almost 27 and currently have a job. The experience made it difficult to trust someone or befriend them again. So the girl I used to befriend, let's not meet again, ever. For context, my mother was a drug addict. She had been using since her early teen years and throughout my childhood that continued. One drug she used very frequently was methamphetamine and prescription stimulants she stole to get high. As I got older, she became more physically violent. Beatings weren't uncommon, and physical threats were expected on any given day. Despite how bad things got though, nothing she did was life-threatening at this point, or at least that's what I thought. Now, my family wasn't a stranger to hardship from food insecurity to loss to temporary homelessness. As things got more difficult for us, my mother's behavior got worse. As her drug use increased, so did her violent behavior. Now, the event I've come here to describe happened when my dad finally was able to get a rental house for us. We had lost our home to a disaster the previous year, so having a place to sleep that wasn't the couches of friends and family or a cheap hotel bed was welcomed with open arms. However, despite this blessing we had, things got so much worse with my mother. Late at night, she would start fights or smash bottles and scream. She would watch us sleep and would make us get out of bed to strip the sheets and prove we weren't hiding things. The worst thing she did though was try to kill my father. I remember distinctly that this happened during a weekend. It was a Saturday and it was partly cloudy outside. I was sitting in my room drawing when the usual argument began. My mom was angry about something that didn't make sense and my dad was trying to calm her down. They were in the kitchen, which was where their fights normally occurred since my mom liked to smash plates. At some point, I decided to leave my room as the fight escalated. My brothers were in the living room, and I decided to get them away from the fighting to keep them safe. That was when I saw the knife in my mom's hand. It was that big, broad knife that comes in most sets. I remember feeling like time slowed down, even now my blood runs cold visualizing it. She had such a deranged look in her eye, but I can remember thinking that my dad wasn't reacting normally. Now I realize he must have been in shock. When I've talked to him recently, he tells me he didn't remember it until we told him what happened that day. 
When I managed to regain my senses, I grabbed my younger brother and pushed him toward the hallway that our rooms were in before grabbing my youngest brother, barely a toddler at the time, and hiding in my room with my phone. Everything from that point is blurry. I remember my youngest brother screaming and crying as I yelled for my brother to keep his door locked. I remember dialing 911 and begging for them to come before my dad was killed. I remember the way the dispatcher's voice sounded and the way she talked to me, but everything even now feels so numb. I don't remember crying, but I know I must have cried at some point because of how exhausted I felt. At some point, the cops arrived and my dad let them in. Thankfully, he was unharmed, but as I mentioned before, I think he was in shock of some kind. When the cops arrived, my mom no longer had the knife, and she was suddenly acting normally. I remember the cops had to coax me out of the room with my brother so they could talk to me about what happened. The whole time, my mom was acting like nothing had happened. The look I saw on her face was gone, and she was just fine. It was like nothing had happened in the first place. That was the scariest thing about her at that moment. I was convinced that she would talk the cops out of taking action in this situation. I thought she would get them to leave and I would be found out for calling them there and she'd hurt me or my dad or even my brothers, but no. Thankfully the cops took what I had said seriously. They took her away to a hospital to be evaluated and we all had a week away from her. She would be back when she was released from the ward but that time she was gone was the most relief I'd felt in a long time. I didn't have to worry about punishment or injury. I was safe for that entire week to recover from that terror I'd experienced. DCFS, which is short for Department of Child and Family Services, was contacted because of this incident and down the road that would lead to me starting therapy and being taken out of her care. If you've read through all of this, thank you. If any of you reading this are going through a situation similar to mine or know someone who is, telling someone can truly change everything. It is scary, but you can get out. There are resources and there are people who care and support out there to lean on. Please, don't be afraid to get out by any means necessary. This incident took place in the summer of 2023. Last year, I transferred with my company to take a new position in a major Midwestern city. My spouse was still working and living back in California for the next few months. So, I rented a studio apartment for myself in a newly renovated apartment building in a popular downtown neighborhood until we could look for a place together. The apartment was small but nice. It was in a secure building with interior hallways and a nice downstairs lobby. I was one of the first tenants to move into this newly renovated building and other new residents soon started moving in. A major advantage of this move was that I'd only be a couple of hours drive from my hometown and my parents. I started my new job and everything was going great. I was enjoying my new neighborhood and the neighbors in the apartment building generally kept to themselves like I did. Then, a new guy moved in across the hall and everything changed. We'll call him David. David was a single man in his 60s and was very different from the college students and young professionals who lived in our building. I started noticing his erratic behavior almost immediately. I would come home from work and he would be sitting in his car in our small parking lot just staring off in the distance. We were having issues that summer with smoke clouds coming over from the vast Canadian wildfires. They were leaving a light dusting of ash on our car similar to pollen. David was convinced that someone was spraying this dust on his car and was accusing various tenants he would run into in the parking lot. He would hoard trash in his apartment and leave trash bags in the hallway causing a foul odor. He would also be yelling to himself in the hallway. I finally had enough and complained to the leasing office. The manager was quick to dismiss my concerns, saying that she'd been in his apartment and everything was fine. In August, my parents' 50th anniversary was coming up and I was excited to go home and spend a weekend with them. A few days before their anniversary, my boss informed me that he would be flying into work on an important project with me that would have us working through the weekend. I was really disappointed and felt like I was letting my parents down. But, I managed to get away for a quick overnight trip in the middle of the week to see them and get back before my boss was due to arrive. I drove down and spent the night with them. 
The next morning, I checked my email as I was getting ready to head back. There was an email from my apartment manager in regard to the incident the night before. The email was very vague, but it stated that a resident was dead and there would be further details coming later. My heart sank and I immediately went pale. My mind instinctively went to my strange neighbor David. I opened up a local news app for my city and the top story was about an active shooter in my apartment building who was killed during a SWAT team standoff the night before. Apparently David approached my next door neighbor in the hallway with a gun and threatened to shoot him. The neighbor ran into his apartment and called 911. David also called 911 and told the dispatcher that his neighbors were hacking his phone and if the police didn't come he was going to start shooting people. The police came and tried to talk to David, but he had barricaded himself in his apartment and claimed to be heavily armed. The state police and the SWAT team soon arrived and David began firing a rifle out his window at anyone he saw in the parking lot below. All of the neighbors on my floor were trapped in their apartments with no way of escape. They had to get down and barricade themselves from the gunfire. There was another building across the street with a direct line of sight into our apartment building. A police sniper took a position in the building across the street and shot David through his window. Then they flew a drone into his open window and confirmed that he was dead with a gun still in his hand. Luckily no one else was injured. I got home later that day to a bullet riddled apartment building and several neighbors who normally didn't speak to each other were hugging and crying and showing each other videos of the incident from their hiding places. I've never been so lucky to have been out of town. If my boss hadn't messed up my plans, I would have been home that night. I'm sorry David didn't get the mental health attention he needed, but he put so many lives in danger.